Would you rather be loved or lovely? I think I'll take both if you can. I think the secret's to be lovely and then you're loved. So, uh, you know, I'll go for both of them. Wealth of Nations or Theory of Moral Sentiments? Theory of Moral Sentiments, for sure. I understand all, well, almost all the Theory of Moral Sentiments. Some of that Stoicism stuff and the, some of the older theories of morality that mm -hmm. he expounds on, I have a little trouble following, whereas Wealth of Nations, large sections, I'm, I'm confused. Chapter on silver, just don't know what to do with that. So I'm going with Theory of Moral Sentiments. That makes me feel better that you don't understand the chapter on silver either. Oh, I my thought gosh. it was just me. Well, that's the, one I, <laughs> that's the one I'm admitting to. There's other sections too. I'll just, let's just keep it quiet. All right. If Adam Smith had a dog, what kind of dog would it be? Well, he wouldn't have a dog. He'd have a cat because he's a sensible cat person, I'm sure. Boo, hiss is all, half the audience. Maybe more than half, maybe a small portion, but. Uh, let's see, if he had a dog, uh, a Scott Terrier, don't you think? A Scott Terrier that would sing um, Burns, being a Scott. You know, by Love is Like a Red, Red Rose. Uh, in fact, that reminds me of a of a vaudeville joke, if I can remember it. Um, guy brings a dog and a cat to a vaudeville manager and says, I have the greatest act of all time. Oh, yeah, I've seen everything, buddy. I've seen all the animal acts. No, no, you haven't seen this one. He says, the cat plays the piano and the dog sings. It's not a Scott Terrier. My mind's sort of a bigger dog, but we'll, for this example. Okay. So the cat's pounding out some song, the dog's singing away, and the, 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 the producer's pretty impressed. He says, you know, and they start negotiating, and while they're negotiating, the cat is, like, pushing at the, at the guy and keeps net, pawing at the guy's pants and, and, and getting him trying to get his attention. And, and finally he says to the, the owner of the act, he says, will you tell your cat to leave me alone? And the cat says, look, buddy, I'm just trying to save you some money. The dog can't sing, I'm a ventriloquist. <laughs> Sorry, anytime you have an excuse to tell that joke, you have to, I mean, it's, first of all, it's clean. Second of all, it involves the singing dog, so it's related to the, what we talked about. Absolutely, perfectly topical. Uh, <laughs> what is the best antidote to the torpor induced by the division of labor? Ooh, the torpor. The torpor. Uh, I think that means drudgery, which Smith conceded, which is a beautiful thing, I think, that in his discussion of specialization, he understood that it could be very dreary doing the same thing mm -hmm. all day. You know, Charlie Chaplin captures that powerfully in, in uh, his movie Modern Times, where he's got a guy all day long, all he does is tighten a bolt. And modernity is what has eliminated the torpor of... of specialization in the division of labor because, as Smith understood, as the division of labor is unleashed and specialization occurs, we get wealthier and wealthier and then we can develop new things and capital gets associated with different tasks that wasn't before and now all of a sudden we have robots. Mm -hmm. So a robot's tightening that bolt over and over again or welding that spot over and over again and so life's a little more pleasant. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that Adam Smith would rather fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? Uh, boy, you know, I, I wish I'd had that question earlier. I would have written a different dissertation topic, <laughs> obviously. Um, I think I'm going to go with, the, what, was the, what was the second thing called? 100, 100 duck-sized horses. I think it's like the duck-sized horses because in my mind, Adam Smith's always got like a big stick when he takes a walk. I don't know if this is accurate memory of him. There's a, we have a few images of Smith, not mm -hmm. many, but one of them I feel like he's got a stick in his hand uh, where he's been on a walk on, uh, I think it's High Street. And um, he could use that stick to scatter the smaller creatures. I think that would be a, a, a useful thing for him. Um, so I think he'd go with the, the small duck-sized mm -hmm. Sounds horses. persuasive. Uh, what do you pursue for pleasure that was once followed from necessity? And, and what is that exactly? So Adam Smith said that things like hunting and fishing are things oh. that we used to do because we needed to in order to survive, but now we do them because they're fun. Yeah, it reminds me, it reminds me of uh, Nassim Taleb, uh, his example of you check into a hotel and a, uh, a, a bell person will hustle out to take your bags out of the trunk so you don't have to be burdened with carrying them and then Half an hour later, you see the same person in the gym lifting heavy weights <laughs> uh, as a form of, of leisure. Uh, so uh, that that is some so has something to do with that. But I, I do I did like to fish mm -hmm. um, when I was younger. I don't fish much anymore, but uh, fishing is a fabulous thing because it's an excuse to spend a great deal of money on a bunch of equipment that lets you look at catalogs all winter long when you can't fish. And then when you do fish, really 
you don't have to really catch anything because the whole thing is to have all the gear, especially fly fishing, which is what I used to do, is to have all the gear and then stand in, you know, in a stream in a beautiful place, look off in the distance. In fact, you don't catch anything. I mean, it's not really designed, fly fishing yeah. isn't really designed, except in the movies. It's not really designed for catching. It's designed for thinking about, spending money on, uh, time the flies, a hopelessly difficult task, uh, that none of which have to, anything to do with catching fish but uh it really ties into the smith observation yeah it's an it's an even better example yeah smith thinks there's no and there's no no purpose result, to it really. yeah. there's no outcome yet. um no S- tangible outcome. <laughs> smith says that one of the times we experience sympathy is when we share an appreciation for the same piece of literature or work mm-hmm. of art so what should people watch or read or listen to in order to sympathize with you yeah i think smith said uh it's important to us that people like what we like, but he said, we, this is really a dark side of human nature. He said, it's even more important that they hate what we hate, uh, but I'm not gonna go into what I hate. Uh, but I say in terms of what I like, I would say musicals, um, Wicked, Hamilton, Les Mis, Man of La Mancha, and then in art generally, um, I would say the Sicilian and the Sistine Chapel, uh, David and Florence, both by Michelangelo. You know, the David's an, un- it's an unbelievable thing. It, I've seen a, I'd seen a million pictures of it, and it, when you see it in person, it's 17 feet tall. It just can't be captured. I took a lot of pictures of it, like a waste of time almost, because even with people in the picture, it doesn't capture the grandeur of it. And then I would say um, the Burgers of Calais by Rodin, which is an, makes me um, moves me every time I see it. I love that okay. work of art. What does your impartial spectator look like? <laughs> Uh, my aunt Dottie? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> my uncle, um, I actually have an uncle Milton, not not Milton Friedman, who we used to call, at, at Chicago, we used to call Milton Friedman Uncle Milton, or Uncle Melty. Uh, but I had an uncle Milton. He's a large man. He's famous in our family for eating. This is before there were sliders. Mm-hmm. He would take a hamburger like this and do this with it, and he's gone. <laughs> he's had a massive paw, kind of Kawhi Leonard size hand. Um, but my impartial spectator, you know, I, I kind of think of that, you know, the little angel with the wings yeah. uh, perched on the shoulder with maybe a little, uh, like a wagging finger down there. Maybe yeah. something like that. You know, he doesn't talk about the one on the other shoulder. No, the, he the doesn't. Nasty, <laughs> uh, the nasty. The not-so-impartial yeah, spectator. The, yeah. the, the devilish, <laughs> uh, mustache-twirling side of you that says, now go ahead, it's okay, who's going to see? The heavily biased spectator. Exactly. The, 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 right, the subjective spectator. <laughs> Oh, I like that. The, instead of the man in the breast, maybe the demon in the breast, yeah. We have to write that article. Yeah, for sure. So Smith warns us that too severe an application to study sometimes brings on lunacy and frenzy. Should we be worried about you? <laughs> uh, you know, it reminds me of a quote from Somerset Mom, and I, I'm not going to get it right, but it's basically, it, it, he says something like, and I, I don't know if he meant it, um, and he's so out of favor now. So not out of favor, but nobody pays any attention to him. I think he's one of the great short story writers uh, of all time. But he says something like, "It's better to to lay in the gutter and look up at the stars than to you know read a thousand books or write a thousand. That's <laughs> one of those those sort of um, um, pans to hedonism that the intellectual occasionally pretends to, to believe. So I don't know if that's true, but um, uh, I love. One of the greatest things about being the host of Econ Talk is I get to read books as my job, and people send me books. If you had said to me when I was 20 years old, you're going to have a job where people are going to send you books for free, I would have just, I would have died and gone to heaven, and I kind of feel like I have sometimes. Last question. Yeah. If an afterlife exists, what would you like to discuss with Adam Smith when you get to meet him? Well, his favorite scotch, of course. Um... Uh, I'd chat with him about why he didn't at least talk about his other book when he was writing his other book. So when mm-hmm. in The Wealth of Nations, he doesn't talk about the theory of moral sentiments, theory of moral sentiments, he doesn't talk about The Wealth of Nations. He writes the theory of moral sentiments first, 1759, revises it all through his life well after he'd finished uh, The Wealth of Nations, and I'm curious how he thought about it. I do not lose sleep over the Adam Smith problem, and I'm here at Liberty Fund today to talk about the Adam Smith problem in in a lecture implicitly. Um, so I, I don't lose sleep about it, but I, I do. I'd like to chat with him, and then I'd like to chat with him about modernity. Um, he didn't foresee the. He understood that some nations grow faster than others, but the idea 
that we could have a standard of living like we have now would be, you know, obviously mind-boggling to somebody who lived in the mm-hmm. middle, second half of the 18th century. It, it would just, it, he would be astounded. Um, and I just like to shoot the breeze with him. What kind of person was he like, you know? Tell him the vaudeville joke. Yeah, I'd tell him the vaudeville joke. I'd sing some Robert Burns, I, you know. I, yeah, there's this story, it might be apocryphal, of um, a dinner party he was at that William Pitt was at. And I think Wilberforce was at it. Some of these great lights of, of the, of the um, England of his day. And he, he's late to the dinner, and he comes in, and they all stand as he comes into the room. And he said, what are you, you know, sit 